Thank you. Better. OK. Better. Hello? Yeah, I have to do this. OK. Stage career pending. Um, OK, so we talk a lot about openness, innovation, and opportunity um, on the web in Mozilla. And, and we do care a lot about this. And as you guys know, we've worked with us for years. It has to be like a key part of everything we do. We can't do anything alone. We're simply not big or strong enough. But the realities of day-to-day -day life is that when the teams are shipping code and things need to be fixed, sometimes this aspect of openness can seem like it gets more tedious than it gets effective. But we can't stop there. That can't stop us in creating open code, and it can't stop us in working in open ways. Um, and so we really wanted to understand how we create a better experience. And that's a better experience for people who want to contribute to Mozilla's mission and the stuff that we do. But it's also a better experience for the people who are working at Mozilla and who want to work in an open way. And one of the ways we do this in design and UX world is that we start off by understanding people's needs. So their motivations, why do they do something? Because when we understand that, we can design better experiences for them. So that was the ground kind of idea of this project, is really how do we create a better experience for contributors who want to help with Mozilla's mission around the world. A really good way of starting to understand people's motivation is to ask them. So we had um, a lot of interviews, uh, 26 in, in total, that were um, between an hour and an hour and a half across the world. Some people in this room that we talked to as well. Um, we talked to people in person in San Fran and London under MOSFES, but we also talked to a lot of people remotely over Skype and video calls. So the people we talked to ranged um, from a lot of different open source networks. We didn't focus just on Mozilla open source contributors because we wanted to understand how are other open source communities doing this, what are people getting out of being part of those other open source communities, and what can we maybe do better. So we talked to primarily technical um, contributors from different projects, a range of different ages. The projects ranged from open source uh, hardware projects, such as the Vvolver project platform, which does bionic arms and uh, robotic arms for people who um, are, are missing a limb. Um, but we also talked to people who were part of like open source hacker spaces across different areas. So there was a lot of breath in the, in the group of people. And I want to say before we uh, go further is that it's not like it was me and Brian and a few others doing this on our own. Um, we worked a lot with the community as we went through it, um, through conversations and small kind of group intercessions, but also through some really big co-creation sessions. Um, one in London where we had about 40 participants, but also one in Shanghai where we actually had over 70 participants. And the way we did this was we basically presented the findings and the things that we saw, and then we asked the teams and the groups there, like, what does this mean? What are the things that come out of this? And that was a huge part of, like, building the recommendations that I'm going to talk to you about today. So what did we find? We found a lot about what motivates contributors, funnily enough. Um, the way that we did these interviews is that we focused on their stories. So it was a lot about getting them to tell us stories so that we could understand how had they first got involved, what was the things that kind of motivated them to get involved, but also telling us stories about when things had been really good. Like what were the things that were happening when this was really good? What were the things that were happening when this is really bad? From a kind of social science perspective, we do that because once we get people to storytell, we can normally better hear the tacit motivations as well as the known motivations that they have. So the stories ranged um, from a lot, like obviously we, we got a lot of information out of this, but one of the stories that I thought was, was really interesting was an 18-year-old um, student um, who was volunteering for the Xperia Android fork. Um, he had started at a very, very young age, um, but he'd found himself totally immersed in this project, and he was now one of the kind of, not leads, but one of the second in command in the project, and it was a huge part of his status and how he moved forward in his career. There was also stories such as a, um, an office assistant who felt that making sure that everyone had access to the internet and understood what was on the internet had kind of driven her to start a local community in her own little local village and are still driving a huge part of the localization forward for Mozilla today. So 
very different people, very different areas. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some of the motivations that we saw, uh, learning being one of them. I'm going to talk about these on a high level. The report is public, and, and I'll share the link afterwards, and you can go into detail. But each high-level motivation area has kind of forked into these under uh, kind of lower level uh, motivations that we saw, which are a bit more specific. But for today, I'm just going to kind of quickly um, brush through them. So learning, I think, is pretty obvious. Um, everyone who's participated in open source knows that the, the learning curve, especially when you start, is pretty steep. Um, and it continues as you go through the, the project. Um, and this was definitely the main uh, motivation for a lot of people to, um, to join. One of the things that we heard from one of our interviews was it's like having a constant update of what matters. Like, I know when new things hit, I just know it comes up on IRC through chat, through other things. It's like having this kind of push metaphor. We thought about it internally as like a kind of news feed that was curated for you. Community was another one. A lot of people were attracted to the community for the unity and for being part of something. Um, a, big, a big part of it was taking part in something that was bigger than themselves and also just belonging to a social group that was important for them. And there was a real belief in obviously the power of these communities. So we heard things like the community is the engine, like we can't work without the engine. Um, but also how community helps us keep going. So this idea that it's your personal blackmail. When I say that I'm going to do something, I've promised that to my friends, and so I will do it, because otherwise, you know, I will let them down. And it was interesting that even for those who work with a corporate entity within the open source project, such as Mozilla or Android or CyanogenMod, Mod, um, this is still a, a huge factor um, for them. The other one was cause, um, and cause, as I put here, can be a lot of different things. It can be um, the cause of doing something better, moving something forward, changing the life for others. But for most people, it was this pure concept of just open source. The way of working that we do in open source and the way we share knowledge that hopefully we all believe fosters innovation in some form. And having that as, as a key reason for continuing working on these things were also important. Fourth and second last is recognition. Um, so a key part of why people really stay is the ongoing recognition that happens. And again, this can be very different, as we've talked about here. Um, for starters, when you're just starting out, like something like a sticker or swag can be immensely important to just show your relationship. But once you get uh, longer term contributors and longer term relationships, it really is about the kind of tacit recognition that happens within the group and within the community as well. Um, a story I thought was interesting here as well is, is one of the guys we talked about who was um, an expert on a really specific fork um, of an open source project said that it was quite nice, you know, when you go to conferences and they introduce you as that guy when you go on stage. You know, there's something about having that feeling of really being an expert on something that's, um, that's a huge part of this as well. And the last one that I want to quickly cover is tangible goals. So most uh, people are also there because they want to see impacts. So whether that is for the junior developer who wants to be able to see their code actually ship in a larger project, or whether it's for the more experienced developer who just want to be able to kind of drive where technology is going, where development and focus is going, and also work on new technology and interesting projects. So. This is not brain science, right? I think if I had talked to any of you guys, you could have told me those five things were pretty important um, for every contributor. Um, but what we do in design and what we do when we, when we do UX is that we really focus on the need and designing those experiences for that need. And one of the ways we do that is that today, we can't design for every single individual yet. AI may change that, and I may be out of a job. But uh, so far, that is not where we are. And so the way we make sure that we look at these different motivations is that we cluster them. We pull them together in things that look alike. And this is complex, right? Like It's not like one person is just inspired by learning, and the other person is just inspired by recognition. So the way that we try to kind of minimize the complexity in this, which is um, in social science what we call a little bit of a finger in air exercise, but tends to work, um, is that we took each of the individuals we talked to, and on each of the scales of these five motivations, we gave them a score from 1 to 10. So what is most important, what is least important for them? And that helped us build like a profile that we could then actually cluster on, which we did. And luckily, the clustering exercise um, led to four distinct uh, kind of groupings coming out. 
So these are the four design personas that I want to talk about um, today. I want to talk a little bit also about, before I go into them, what we use design personas for. So as I said, we really focus on needs and the motivations when we design these experiences, because that's just how things move best for us. Um, and personas are key in this, because it allows us to put a face and a person behind things that sometimes are a little bit tangible. Now, if I just say learning to you and like 10% recognition and 50% something else, that's really hard to build for. But if I present you with a person person that has specific needs and a story, it's much easier for us to design experiences for them. And that's why we use design personas a lot. I'm sure most of you who, who work in development will have seen these from your UX partners in the field as well. So I'm going to quickly go through um, each of these. Again, they are, they are online if you want them. And the first cluster we saw was uh, a cluster we've called the independence. The pictures here are fake, by the way, because we really want to keep people who partook in this study um, kind of anonymous. So this is just a Flickr picture that was on Creative Commons license. Um, so the one thing we saw in this cluster of people we'd interviewed was that they were all quite young. They had the obviously common characteristic of being high in recognition and tangible goal as main motivations, but they were all very young in their career. And they're often focused on a really specific output, right? This is the tangible outcome for them. They're there because uh, things we heard was like, my teacher had said, you need to be part of dev communities. And this um, young female had no idea what that meant. And so she Googled dev communities and open source came up and hence she got involved and has now been like a contributor for five years. So sometimes it's, it's fairly random, kind kind of ways that they get into it, but mainly it's so that they can build up their skills, their networking, and um, get things that they can put on their CV and show and move their careers forward with. However, they stay in open source because they get enticed by the community and they get enticed by that recognition and status that they can get when they actually successfully ship something and get it um, put into code. The second group we saw was we called the leaders. The reason we called them the leaders is that they all had the same characteristic, that they had been contributors for a longer period of time. So it's not exactly a, a fancy name for them. Um, but they obviously were quite on the other end of motivation spectrum. So they score fairly high in recognition, fairly high in cost, but really what matters to these people is the community. That's what's keeping them there, and that's what's keeping them really engaged. Um, this is also where we heard the, the community is my personal blackmail comment um, and heard things like, you know, for one of the Mozilla contributors we talked to, um, they said that there's, you know, this great feeling about being able to say, I am the expert of Mozilla in my country. That is like me as the go-to person. The third and, and second last group that I want to talk about is we called the fixers. Uh, we called them the fixers because there was this great quote from, from one of the guys that was in this that said that, you know, I have a fixer mentality. Uh, I just want to fix things. If they're broken, I can't leave them broken. And they are uh, scoring really high on kind of tangible outcomes, which is obvious from this quote, but also learning. And so they are really there because they have a specific problem. They often join because they have an own project they're working on or they want to work on a project that's relevant to one of their own things and open source is a way for them to get that done quicker with more people or collaborate on that problem. But they stay because this is really an ongoing source of learning for them. They feel like they can keep like up on the pulse, is that, I don't know how you say that, but they can keep up to date and they can learn new things and this is like their continuous learning development program for them. So lastly is the citizens, and um, we actually call them the activists to start with. Um, I don't know quite why we changed the citizens, but, but we did. It sounded better, maybe. Um, they are really high in cause and communities. Um, again, they span ages. We can't say anything specific about age groups. Um, they were most of them all professional, and they are really there because they care about the cause. And this is like whether it's open source or web literacy or whatever it can be that they're working on. Some of the people we talked to from the Vivolvo community really cared about, you know, enabling people with disabilities to move, to work, to engage, and hence they spend uh, a lot of their free times building um, open source bionic arms. Um, but most of what we heard from these people is that it's not about getting paid or necessarily just being able to do this full time. It's the satisfaction I get from contributing my time and my knowledge and seeing this area move forward. All right, so in the last five minutes, I want to talk a little bit about what this means because 
having design personas is great, but like how do we move from there to the actual experience that we want to build? And this is an ongoing journey for us at Mozilla. We're by no means done, and this project is still happening. Um, but one of the first things we did is that we sat down with the community and we sat down with the internal people, some of the internal people, we're not done with this process either, um, who work with volunteers, and we talked about what does this mean for you? Like what are the things that you do different knowing this, that we can do different knowing this internally in Mozilla. So this is very um, Mozilla focused, so apologize for this, but I think that there are some general trends that pretty much every open source uh, community can, can utilize. So one of the recommendations that came out was this idea of showcasing the value exchange. I've used a very businessy word in here, value proposition, but the reason that we've used that is because it's super important. One of the key things that we saw um, when we talked to people is that in the beginning of their engagement with um, any of the open source communities, they didn't really understand the benefits to the full extent that they do when they're involved. So when they start, they maybe think, okay, this is great, uh, I can do some code, I can learn some code, and once they've been involved longer, the benefits are so much more than that. It's the community, it's the network, it's all of these more tacit benefits that you can't really put your, your finger on. And so ensuring that we're better at communicating those up front when people start will also help them overcome some of that hurdle of getting involved first time, which we all know can be, can be hard if you don't necessarily know anyone in the community. Reinforcing and frequent communication on how to get involved. This is the big hurdle of how to get involved. Now this workshop was done with some of the people from our open design community as well, and so there's a lot around like, how can we also visualize this? Like, can we use visualization as an aid for this? So this is some of the things that we're working on now to try and figure out how we do. Um, so we wanted to communicate and visualize an onboarding process that gives them a sense of where they are in the process. This is obviously a really hard problem, but one that we're really committed to working on. We also want to visualize Mozilla and what we're about. That's everything from like the projects we're working on um, to the things we're doing. Some of the projects that are tapping into this is like the Pulse project. If you haven't heard it, you should check it out. Mozilla Pulse Google search will probably get you there. Um, where some of our foundation people have built a site that basically pulls out all the small projects that are happening across Mozilla and gives people a better an idea of what can I like contribute to, what can I work on. The last thing we thought about doing, which is uh, work in progress, was creating a concept, contact map of Mozilla. So this is kind of the idea of creating a heat map across to see where people are that you can get in contact with from the different projects. Third recommendation, show how you can make a difference for the mission. And this is basically focused a lot, obviously, on the kind of citizen group that we talked about. But this idea of highlighting that Mozilla is obviously about the open web, but we do a lot of other things, like web literacy, uh, like working on projects to connect rural women uh, in India, and all these other things that are kind of happening with our community and around our community. We also wanted to do a, we have the, the, the kind of get started bug list. We wanted to do something similar for people who are more interested in the cause, right? So what are the easy things that people can get involved with and kind of start off straight away? We also talked about building a culture of positive recognition. I think this is pretty obvious for anyone who's in open source, so I'll kind of let you read it, but this idea that recognition is really important for us. We also think that connecting to the communities early is really important. Now, at Mozilla, this is a something that the community themselves manages and if you don't get through the right place or you're not contacted through the 100% right person, this can be a little bit of a thing where people fall through the cracks. But we know that once you have that personal connection, once you have feel like you're part of that community, that's really what makes you stay and that's really what makes you feel like this is a worthwhile use of your time. Lastly, and this is for the more kind of experienced contributors, we wanted to foster co-ownership. And what we mean by co-ownership is that things go bad and things go well. And obviously, as uh, Brian said, you know, this has been a turbulent year for Mozilla. But it's important not to be like, this is all good and we're all happy. It's important to own this both good and bad days together. And giving people that co-ownership and on pulling them into both the hard times and the good times is really what makes us a joint community. And hence, we also need to be more transparent in the way that we're working. Um, and that's ongoing work, both from the leadership side, but also from us working with volunteers on the ground. 
So you can kind of look at these recommendations. There are many more in the document that's online, but I've tried to kind of look at how we're looking at these as we think about how people engage with us um, across their experience with Mozilla and where we're focusing in. So as I said, it's online, it's, it's open source. Um, if you want to go have a look how we clustered, how we did this, you can do this here. It's 250 pages, good luck. Um, but, you know, <laughs> if you're really interested. So next steps, so this work continues. So this is um, a project we started last year, as I said, but we've actually partnered now with Howard University, who's really interested in understanding more about open source as well. And they're for, like, looking further into this. So we're still looking for people to interview. We're looking for existing contributors for all open source communities. We're looking for people who've left. We're looking for people who maybe have thought about it, but aren't really convinced. We're also doing a survey. You'll see some posters around here. Um, and again, this is run by Howard, but um, we would love if you could take part of it. And we also just want your feedback. Um, anything that you have, questions, input, we'd, we'd love to hear. Malvika is from Howard, um, and I'm R. Jensen. If you have any questions or comments, that is where to go. Is Sorry? Is she is not. She has a newborn baby, and so she's stuck. But she's here in... Yeah. <laughs> Can you take some questions? Okay, so really we're probably the best, be the best timekeeper of all the speakers all day, so we have loads of time for questions. Let's take five minutes. So uh, I will ask two things. We've only got one working mic, unfortunately. So ask your question really loud. And Rina, I would ask you to repeat the question on the mic, please. Thank you. Thank you. So this is not a quant project. This is what we call a qualitative project. So having a statistician look at 26, sorry, repeat the question. <laughs> Jesus, it's right there. He asked, have we had a statistician look at this both from the point of view of the methodology and from how we recruited the participants to it? And so this is not a quant project. It's a qual project, and so it's a different way of gathering information. What we're trying to do with Howard is to add that quantitative part into it, and that's part of what we're trying to do with the survey. And so the way that we look at this in social science is that these are ways for you to gather information. You can't, quant can help you understand how and what, but it will never help you understand why. So we're using this to understand the why, and then we're using the quant to go back and look at the how, and can this actually be replicated on large scale? Can we see this back in a survey? And that's how we're doing that. Yes, so the survey and everything that we've... Sorry. Thank you. Jesus. Um, he asked if we had tools uh, that p other people can use in other open source uh, projects to kind of replicate um, these surveys and use in their own projects. So everything's uh, online. It, I, if you email Malvika, she can tell you where it is. It's on Howard website somewhere that I actually can't remember on my kind of feet right now. But if you go there, she will talk to you about the, if you email her, she'll talk to you about the method she's using. Uh, she can talk a little bit more about how she's looking into this from a statistician point of view as well. Um, and she will give you the survey. And, and the background and everything to use in your own projects as well. So the question was if this was a particular Mozilla project or general open source communities. So the first round of interviews that we did was definitely higher rated on Mozilla because it was a Mozilla question. The partnership that we've started now with Howard is general open source. So that's why Malvika is still looking for interviewees and is going to do more of these as well. Frustration. Yeah. Uh, so the question was if we've looked into the negative blog post around add-ons to understand more about how the community is feeling right now. And the answer to that is that Malvika is also running some um, like 
basic content scraping to understand sentiment analysis online. So it will probably appear in that. Um, but again, I would reach out to her to understand more about how she's uh, doing that. Let me see if I got that right. <laughs> it reminded you of a project that I didn't hear about. And did you ask what inspired us to get involved? Or yeah. So we did, uh, in the beginning of this speech, out to quite a few different open source communities because we wanted to talk to people from, from different areas. Uh, the feedback we got from the ones we talked to was that they weren't doing anything. But I should also say we haven't reached out by any means to all of them, and that is probably something that we should consider, but we haven't done that. Okay, one more, one more question. Okay, one more all right. Oh. Yeah, one more there. Uh, Big loud. The slide with the URL. the URL. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you.